Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Milwee, uh, Trinity, Alabama, Mount View Baptist Church. Uh, I began our study uh, last night at church by telling everyone, well, Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, I said that because uh, the text we're going to look at uh, today is the most familiar uh, text uh, surrounding the birth of Christ. But I want to walk us through it slowly uh, this morning because sometimes a familiarity with a text can cause us uh, to miss the important truths that are being uh, communicated. So let's just jump right in and get started uh, today. Uh, the text begins uh, by saying, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world uh, should be taxed. This was the first registration when Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his hometown. Well, when we began our study of Luke, I told you that Luke was a very meticulous uh, historian, and, and therefore he carefully points out that Caesar Augustus was the emperor of Rome at the time uh, when Christ was born. In, in addition, he shares with us that Quirinius was the governor of uh, Syria. Augustus's official name at birth was Gaius Octavius, and in our history books, he's most often referred to as Octavian. Uh, he was born in 62 BC and was the grand nephew of Julius Caesar. He came to power after uh, Julius Caesar was executed or assassinated, and, and he ruled the empire from 27 BC to 14 AD. As Roman emperors go, he was an excellent ruler, demonstrating great military, political, and social skills by ending all civil wars and extending Rome's boundaries to the edges of the known world of his day. In fact, he ushered in what's been called the Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome. Uh, this uh, unheard of uh, time of tranquility tranquility uh, allowed for the construction of a massive road system which made uh, travel easy uh, all over the empire. Uh, it was this excellent road system that later uh, led to the easy spread of the uh, gospel. I'm convinced, therefore, that this is one of the reasons that Paul writes in Galatians 4.4, 4, uh, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under uh, the law, or as the New Living Translation uh, says, but when the right time came, God sent his son. So, uh, therefore, the first lesson that we pick up on uh, today is that Jesus Christ was born at just the right time. In other words, God orchestrated events so that Christ would be born during this time of world peace. It was a time of great freedom. Uh, Caesar's policy was to grant limited freedom and autonomy to uh, his subjects, uh, 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 respecting their customs and their religions, uh, uh, but they did still have to pay taxes. Uh, this is what brought Mary and Joseph uh, to Bethlehem. Uh, the Romans ordinarily registered people in their current place of residence uh, instead of making them go to their hometown. But in accord with Jewish custom, uh, Mary and Joseph had to go back uh, to um, uh, Bethlehem because, as our text is going to tell us in just a moment, uh, they were, or he was from the house and lineage uh, of David. I also found it interesting in some of the commentaries to discover that uh, due to various delays and difficulties, uh, Caesar's census was not carried out in Palestine until two to four years after it was first announced. But finally, he imposed a strict deadline for compliance. Uh, therefore, average citizens like Mary and Joseph had to uh, you know, hasten their obedience, hustle to their uh, place to comply with the law, Again, all this just goes to show that our God was in complete control. He providentially orchestrated events so that Mary and Joseph would be in Bethlehem at just the right time. Well, look at verses 4 and 5. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Uh, so Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem because uh, they actually were both direct descendants of King David. It was for both uh, Jesus' parents the home of their ancestors. Uh, the, the Bible doesn't make it clear whether or not Mary had to accompany Joseph uh, to Bethlehem, but there was no way he was going to go off and leave her when she was so close to time to give birth. It ensured um, his presence with her when the baby was to be born. But more importantly... This trek to Bethlehem ensured that Mary and Joseph were going to be where the prophet said 
uh, they would be when the Messiah was born. Uh, you might remember from our study of Matthew's gospel that when the wise men arrive in Jerusalem asking about the Christ child and, and where he was to be born, all the scribes and Pharisees immediately answered, well, that's going to be in Bethlehem. And they knew this because Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says, But you, O Bethlehem of Pathra, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. Uh, therefore, uh, the world and national conditions uh, compelled Mary and Joseph uh, to go to Bethlehem, but more importantly, uh, God orchestrated it to fulfill uh, the words of the prophet Micah. Every believing Jew uh, knew that the true Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Uh, therefore, without even mentioning Micah, Luke relates the birth of Jesus uh, as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Every person hearing or reading this story would have known exactly why Jesus needed to be born in Bethlehem. He could not have been the Messiah otherwise. So, uh, God in his providence sent Jesus at just the right time to just the right place. But now number three, for all the right reasons. Look at verses six and seven. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and, and laid him in a manger because there was no room or no place for them uh, in the inn. Now, I've always thought it's fun to uh, imagine the conversation between uh, Mary and Joseph when she learned that they were going to have to stay uh, in a stable. What do you mean there's no room in the inn? Well, honey, I mean, he said, there, there, there's no room. Well, that's just great, Joseph. I've been riding on a donkey all day. My back hurts, my feet hurt. And do I need to remind you that I'm pregnant? <laughs> you just march right back in there and tell them we got to have room. Well, we don't know exactly how that uh, conversation played out. But uh, I, I'm sure that she was not happy about uh, these uh, arrangements. But nevertheless, Jesus Christ, God's own son, God in flesh, was born in a cattle stall. Now, I know that some people want to argue and, and fuss over whether or not it was a cave or a barn or a shack. But all that really matters is that the King of kings and Lord of lords humbled himself and came to earth and was born in an area usually reserved for animals. The Bible says they laid him in a manger. Uh, literally, that means a feeding trough. He could have made a grand entrance, but instead he chose a humble birth and lived a humble life. Uh, Vance Havner says this about his birth. He says, God set it up in a pattern we never would have dreamed. He was born in a stable to a lowly peasant couple in an insignificant town in an obscure corner of the Roman Empire. Christ came in humility to point us to God. As one of my seminary professors uh, would often say, he would say the star of Bethlehem is God's asterisk in the sky with a footnote on earth that said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So again, Jesus Christ came uh, to earth for all the right reasons. He came that we might have new life through him. We, he came that we might have life and have it more uh, abundantly. Uh, we know because the verse immediately after that most familiar verse, John 3, 16, John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Now, I want you to think about one thing. Um, if God in his providence could arrange things so that Jesus Christ could be born at just the right time in just the right place for all the right reasons, don't you think he has the ability to take care of you? Well, I believe that he does, and I hope that you'll put your faith and trust uh, in him. Max Lucado, in his book, uh, God Came Near, which is about the birth of Christ, uh, says this, he says, wide awake is Mary. My, how young she looks. Her head rests on the soft leather of Joseph's saddle. The pain has been eclipsed by wonder. She looks in the face of her baby, her son, her Lord, his majesty. And listen to this. He says, at this point in history, the human being who best understands who God is and what he is doing 
is a teenage girl in a smelly stable. She can't take her eyes off of him. Somehow Mary knows that she is holding God. So this is he. She remembers the words of the angel. His kingdom shall never end. So here's Mary in this stable, looking into the face of her Savior. I mean, can you imagine the feeling of knowing that you are holding in your arms the hope for the entire world? <laughs> but let's leave Mary for just a few minutes, and let's, um, let's move outside of Bethlehem into those fields surrounding uh, the little town, and let's see what's happening out there. Verse 8, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Well, let me ask you a question. When was the last time you received some? I mean, really good news. Maybe it was a good grade on your progress report. Maybe you got a promotion. Maybe you found out you're going to get a bonus. Uh, maybe you got a stimulus check. I don't know what it was. But I'm positive that when you got that news, you got on the phone and you called somebody and you told them about it. When we receive good news, uh, we, we can't help but share it. Well, we've received the greatest news in the world to share. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I mean, for centuries, the Jewish people had waited for the arrival of the Messiah. And now in the middle of the night, a cold, dark, lonely night, an angel suddenly appears uh, to unsuspecting shepherds out in the middle of, of a field and says, Unto you a Savior is born. And he is Christ the Lord. Jesus the Messiah has arrived. The most exciting news the world has ever received. Therefore, we got wonderful news uh, to share. Jesus Christ came to save people from their sins. He, he came to set us free. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. So we have joyful, happy, exciting news. But the angel's not done. Look at how the text continues. And this will be a sign unto you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. Throughout the Bible, we have uh, stories of people encountering angels. For instance, uh, an angel told Abraham that his wife Sarah was going to have a baby. Uh, Jacob actually wrestled with an angel. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was in the temple going about his business when an angel appeared to him and told him that his wife Elizabeth was going to have a baby in her old age. And of course, we have all the events we talked about uh, last week uh, surrounding when the angel appeared to Mary and Joseph and, and told them about everything that was going on with the baby. But nowhere in the Bible do we have a whole company of angels getting together except here. Our text says, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. Therefore, the significance of this event cannot be overstated. A great company of angels appeared because this was praiseworthy news that required more than just one angel. <laughs> it took a whole multitude of angels to share this news. The creator of the universe has come to earth in the form of a, a man. Is it any wonder that the angel said, glory to God in, in the highest? This was significant. This was praiseworthy. This was awe-inspiring news. This was the greatest news in the history of of the world up to that point, topped only by the news of another angel some 33 years later that said, he is not here, he is risen, just as he said. Somebody told me about a little girl that was uh, frightened in her room one night during a thunderstorm, and she called out, you know, help, daddy, daddy, come help me. And, and he said, honey, don't worry, God loves you and he's going to take care of you. To which she replied, I know that God loves me, but right now I need somebody with some skin on. <laughs> well, that's what the incarnation is all about. God stepped out of heaven and became a man so you and I could look at Jesus and say, that's what God looks like with skin on. Philip Yancey in one of his books writes, imagine for a moment becoming a baby again giving up language and muscle uh, coordination, the ability to eat solid food, God as a fetus. 
Or imagine uh, being a sea slug, he says. The analogy is probably closer. Uh, on that day in Bethlehem, the maker of all that is took form as a helpless, dependent newborn. God loved us so much that he became one of us. He became one of us so that we might have a relationship with him. Therefore, we have wonderful reasons to proclaim this news. It's joyful news, it's praiseworthy news, but it's also amazing news. Look at verse 15. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had said. Can you imagine what it was like to be a shepherd on that fateful night? I mean, first of all, can you imagine what a boring job it is to be a shepherd? <laughs> I mean, you're out in the field in the middle of the night. You're just trying to stay awake, trying to watch over and protect the, the sheep. Can you imagine what a boring job that is? But then all, all of a sudden, can you imagine how frightening it would have been for the sky to suddenly come to life with a multitude of angels? Can, can you imagine the chaos and the confusion that this caused with the sheep? Well, to the shepherd's credit, uh, they hustled into Bethlehem to, to see this child that the angels had told them about. And the text tells us they didn't keep quiet about what the angels shared with them. Uh, they, they went in the city to check it out, and, and then they told everybody what they had discovered. Look again at verse 17. And when they saw it, they made known the sayings that had been told them uh, about this child. So the Bible says they, they spread the word about Jesus. So having said that, let me ask you a question. Whose responsibility is it to share the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, of course, it's our responsibility. If we don't do it, who's going to do it for us? It's our task as Christians to tell people the good news about Jesus Christ. Uh, however, it's not difficult uh, because, as we have seen today, it's, it's joyful news, it's praiseworthy news, it's amazing news, but it's also, listen, it's life-changing news. Look at verses 19 and 20. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Now, think about this for just a moment. Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, none of them would ever be the same following this night in Bethlehem. Well, why is that? They'll never be the same because they experienced life-changing news. Once you truly encounter the Savior, your life will never be the same. I mean, I think about the shepherds again. How can they go back to the ordinary, the ho-hum, the boredom of life after encountering uh, the Savior for themselves? How can you go back to the way things were once you meet Jesus Christ face to face? Uh, the comfortable sameness of their lives was gone forever because of what happened that night. I mean, who could ever forget the radiance of the angels in the sky? Who else could talk about getting a personal invitation from an angel to go and see this newborn king? Who else could tell about the night sky being illumined with a whole host of angels singing and praising God? Their lives were changed forever. They were in the presence of the newborn king. They saw him, maybe touched him. They were captivated by him. They will never be the same. But again, how can we be the same? How can we keep quiet? How can we refuse to tell? How can we not tell all the great things that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us? Well, this begs the question, then, why did he do it? He did it because he saw that centuries of broken lives needed a Savior. He did it, listen, because he loves you and because he loves me. He did it because he wants us to experience this life-changing news for ourselves. Listen, we have the resources, we have the manpower, we have the knowledge uh, to take this good news of Jesus Christ to every creature on earth. But for whatever reason, we're not doing it. So I want to challenge you uh, today uh, to share with others uh, the love of Christ. Tell people what Jesus has done for you because we have joyful, praiseworthy, amazing, life-changing news because the angel again said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let me share this with you and we'll finish up today. I read where one guy said, You know, it's not our job to reach. It's not your job to reach everyone. He said, If you think it's your job to reach everyone, then you're going to be so overwhelmed that you'll not reach anyone. 
But he said, if we realize God wants us to reach someone and understand this someone is probably already in our life, then the task doesn't seem quite as daunting, and we begin to think about who this someone might be. Listen to me. Somebody in your life needs to know about the good news of Jesus Christ. But let's get back to Mary for, for just one moment. She's looking in the face of her baby, and her mind must have been filled with questions as to the course that his life would take. I'm sure she was thinking about everything the angel had said, everything the shepherds had said, and, and how is all this going to work out and what's going to happen to him. But of course, time is told of this uncommon yet <clears throat> common birth. Jesus Christ did prove to be the Savior of the world. The question for us now is how are we going to respond to him? Will you accept him and make him Lord and Savior of, of your life? Or will you turn your back and walk away like so many have done down through the centuries? The Bible says that Mary treasured up these things and she pondered them in her heart. I mean, she thought about them. I, I want to challenge you to do the same today because the angel said, uh, to the shepherd, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ uh, the Lord. If Jesus Christ really is the Savior, then have you made him your Savior? Savior literally means deliverer or preserver. So is there anything you need delivered from today? If Jesus Christ is really, <clears throat> excuse me, if Jesus is really the Christ, then have you allowed him to be Christ in your life? Christ literally means the anointed one or the Messiah. This is why Andrew said to Simon in, in John 1 41, we have found the Messiah, which is interpreted uh, Christ. Have you allowed Jesus Christ to be the Messiah in your life? Have you embraced his message? Have you made him your own? And then finally, the angel said he is Christ the Lord. This is the only place in the New Testament where Jesus is called Christ the Lord. Lord is from the Greek word kurios, and it's a derivative of the word kurios, which means power and authority. So basically, our text is saying that Jesus is the anointed deliverer with the power and authority to save. Well, that's a mouthful. But the question still remains, if Jesus Christ is the anointed deliverer with the power and authority to save, have you allowed him to make a difference in, in your life? H have you received this deliverance? Have you acknowledged him for who he is? Have you made him a Lord, the Lord and authority of your life? Well, my prayer today is that you will commit or recommit your life to him. Because as the angel said, for unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And we are eternally grateful for that. Well, thank you for watching today, friends. God bless you.